Good parents will do everything they can to provide for their children, and Tan Quen Chai and Li Mei Ying had four children, so they certainly had their work cut out for them. But on the morning of January 6, 1979, the parents returned to their small apartment to find a horrific, tragic crime had been committed, and their four children were dead. Today on Dark Matters, a case described by the authorities that investigated it as cruel, brutal, and inhuman the Tan Sibling Murders. In Geelong Baru, Singapore, on the fourth floor of Block 58 of a housing and development apartment complex, lived the Tan family. Though the apartment only had one room, Tan Quen Chai, the father, and Li Mei Ying, the mother, made the apartment work for them and their four children. The youngest and only daughter, Tan Chin Ni, was just five years old and attended kindergarten. The three boys all attended Bendemir Road Primary School, with Kok Peng being the oldest at ten, Kok Hin, the middle son, at eight, and finally Kok Soon, just six years old. Despite the cramped quarters, according to the Straits Times, the Tan parents were, quote, very attached to their children and had a plethora of pictures of them, everything from, quote, picnics, laughing at birthday parties, and proudly posing at kindergarten graduation ceremonies. But the family had to make ends meet somehow. Quen Chai and Mei Ying shuttled children to school every morning as a part of their transportation business, and one morning in January of 1979, the parents left to do their job with their children safely tucked into bed, but upon returning home, they walked right into a parent's worst nightmare. Saturday, January 6th, 1979. The weekend didn't mean rest from Quen Chai and Mei Ying's bus transport job, so they set out at 6.35 a.m., leaving all four of their children still asleep inside the flat. At approximately 7.10 a.m., Mei Ying called the home phone in the apartment to wake her children and tell them to get ready for school, but there was no answer. She tried twice more, but each time, no one picked up the receiving line. Concerned, Mei Ying called a neighbor and asked if they would check on the children, but the neighbor was met with silence upon knocking on the door. It isn't until 10 a.m., three and a half hours after the Tan parents initially left for work, that they returned home, where they found their children, not asleep, but viciously murdered. Mei Ying stumbled across the mutilated bodies of Chen Ni, Kok Peng, Kok Hin, and Kok Soon, and each had a minimum of 20 slashes to their bodies and were all dressed in pants and t-shirts and were stacked on top of one another in the family's bathroom. The oldest child, Kok Peng, had long hair gripped in his right hand, his entire arm nearly severed from his body, and Chen Ni had gashes all along her face. Kok Hin and Kok Soon were just as badly wounded. But despite the violent scene, the only remaining trace of blood was found in the kitchen sink. The rest of the apartment was immaculate, and there was no sign of forced entry, and nothing was taken, leaving stunned and disgusted authorities to believe this was no random act of violence, that the Tan's killer knew them, and later they would realize just how well. Following the murders, paranoia fell over the Block 58 flats. Wondering if there was a killer in their midst, the children were kept at an arm's length when they normally were allowed to play and wander on their own, and parents chaperoned their children to school. The investigation didn't do anything to dispel the idea that there was a killer among the residents. Due to the swift and brutal nature of the murders and the lack of forced entry, police felt the murderer likely knew the Tans very well, and that the entire massacre was premeditated, as there was little evidence of bloodshed left behind. Someone had clearly taken the time to clean up the crime scene and themselves, at least enough to not leave a trail before exiting. And thinking of the timeline, the Tans left at 6.35 a.m. and called the house three times at 7.10 a.m., after which a neighbor knocked on the apartment door, no answer any of those times. 
either the murder was already committed or in progress, or possibly the killer was doing cleanup during the attempts to check on the children. Whoever committed the murders, it seems, knew the four Tan children would be home alone. And it didn't seem random, again, because there was no sign of forced entry, either means that A, the children knew and trusted their attacker enough to let them inside the home, or B, the attacker had some other means to get inside, such as a house key, which Mei Ying was reported to have recently lost around the time of the murder. Authorities concluded there were likely two murder weapons taken from the Tan's kitchen, a chopper and a knife, neither of which were ever located. And heartbreakingly enough, it seems the eldest boy, 10-year-old Kok Peng, tried to fend off his attacker and ended up with his arm nearly severed and several long strands of hair clenched in his right hand. As far as I was able to tell, no DNA tests were ever conducted on this hair, and even if it were now tested, it's unknown if we would have anything to compare it to. Utterly sickened and heartbroken by the murders, the Criminal Investigation Department, CID for short, put their special investigation section on the case, hoping to determine the who and the why. After Mei Ying's brother postulated to the media that the motive for the crime could possibly have been in relation to an illegal taunting scheme, detectives looked into that specific line of possibility. Now, a taunting scheme, according to Investopedia, is a system for raising capital in which individuals pay into a common pool of money and then receive a dividend based on their share and the performance of the investments made with that pooled money. The principal invested in the taunting is never paid back to the investor. Rather, the investor receives dividends until his or her death. If a shareholder dies, his or her shares are divided up among the surviving investors. So basically, a bunch of people put money into one place, receive payments in intervals based on investments made, and at the end of it all, whoever survives the longest could end up with everyone's shares. However, I'm assuming authorities found no follow-up with this theory, as it wasn't mentioned more than once, and on top of that, there are some issues with this motive. Reddit user It Takes a Redditor posed the question that since the children have no authority over the family's money, why would they have been killed? Wouldn't the parents have been the ones to be targeted? And I completely agree, unless it was a revenge plot associated with a taunting scheme and not actually a move to hasten the death of the other shareholders. But I'd say this is less likely to be the case, though it is possible. In addition, the Tans informed the media that they had no known enemies and hadn't offended anyone. But after two weeks with no leads, another painful reminder of the Tan's loss showed up in the mail in the guise of a Chinese New Year's card. Inside the card was a note written in Mandarin and signed, quote, The Murderer. The message called the Tan parents Ah Chai and Ah Eng, which were their nicknames. But perhaps the most painful and telling part of the note was the line that read, Now you can have no more offspring. Ha ha ha. Mei Ying had undergone a sterilization process following the birth of daughter Qin Ni, something only someone close with the family should have been aware of. This solidified that the authorities were looking at someone familiar with the Tans. After the parents were questioned, in addition to 100 other suspects, the family pled for anyone with information to come forward, but nothing concrete came of it. If neighbors knew anything, most were staying silent. But authorities felt that someone either knew or had seen something the day of the murders. In questioning over 100 possible suspects, there were a few standouts that made the newspapers along with several witness statements. So let's run through the ones mentioned in the Straits Times newspaper now. On January 7th, 1979, two women were detained and questioned about the killings, but were released not long after, and law enforcement refused to comment on their involvement or if they'd given police any new information to go off of. Then, once the murders go public, one man began telling Chinese newspapers he'd witnessed a couple fleeing the scene of the murder, covered in blood. However, it was later found out that this was a fabrication and nothing more than a hoax. Then, fellow residents told authorities that one man claimed he'd witnessed part of the murders from his sixth floor apartment window. Allegedly, this man glanced down and saw a man struggling with five-year-old Chin Ni, and he dismissed it as a parent disciplining their child, never reporting it. While this sounded like a promising lead, authorities were unable to track down or identify this supposed witness, and they reached a dead end. 
But then came what was possibly the most vital witness testimony. A taxi driver out of Topayo told authorities about a suspicious man in his 20s who entered his taxi at approximately 8 a.m. the morning of the murders. He said the man's entire left side was stained with blood and he brandished a knife which was, quote, banged against the taxi door. After the police relayed this information to Mr. Tan, they were shocked to learn that he knew exactly who was being described. The Tan family referred to this man as uncle. He was a Malaysian man who saw the Tans very often, almost daily, to use their phone. The taxi driver witness picked uncle out of a lineup as the same man who entered his taxi. The police felt that maybe they had finally caught a break. However, not much is known about the line of questioning, but two weeks after being detained, he was released. According to the Straits Times, this was due to, quote, a lack of evidence connecting him to the murder. It's curious that the newspaper also mentions Uncle later moved out of his Block 58 flat with his sister. His whereabouts afterwards are unknown. And another unsettling coincidence pointed out by Reddit user ShiftKGB was that if Uncle was detained the day of the killings or close to it and released two weeks later, his release aligns with the disturbing piece of mockery mail received by the Tans two weeks after the killings. But perhaps the saddest part of the case in reference to witness testimony is that one woman, under normal circumstances, would have seen anyone exiting or entering the Tan's property. Neighbor, 68-year-old Yam Yin Tin, normally spent mornings sitting in the corridor between the apartments, watching the youngsters of the building play. However, that particular morning, she'd been washing her hair and hadn't been in her usual spot, and therefore hadn't witnessed anyone coming or going from the apartment. But what was the motive? Was it truly related to some sort of money scheme or maybe a gambling debt gone wrong? Several Redditors have speculated on the possibility that Mei Ying could have been having an affair and that this was an act of a jealous lover. User Jillyfish makes a good point in that it's possible if Mei Ying was engaged in an affair with the killer that it might have given her reason to tell him she wasn't able to become pregnant again. Personally though, I don't think I buy the affair angle. All accounts of the story paint the parents as absolutely devastated by the event which, a fair or not, you would be, fair enough. However, if she was unhappy in her marriage after losing her four children, what would be her reason for staying? And she did stay, because as awful and as tragic as this case is, there is a bit of brightness at the end. The children were buried alongside one another, dressed in their best, on January 7th, 1979, in the Chua Chu Kong Cemetery. In their coffins, they had several of their favorite books and toys, but the parents did keep many of the possessions the children left behind. Mei Ying, in speaking with the Straits Times, said, We will never part with these things. Devastation was clear for all family members, but especially for their mother, Mei Ying, who reportedly had trouble remaining conscious, watching her four children be laid in their coffins. Father Quinn Chai later told the newspaper that he'd been unable to concentrate while performing his bus shuttle duties, and later, he and Mei Ying both began working at a plastic machining firm. The Tans never moved out of the apartment of the massacre, referring to it as a home with, quote, four walls of emptiness. Still, the Tans hoped to fill the empty space and registered with the social welfare department, hoping to adopt one boy and one girl into their family to begin anew. Unfortunately, at the time, there were no children available. Then Mei Ying learned of a reverse sterilization operation that seemed almost too good to be true. But after undergoing the procedure, she was able to conceive again. And on December 30th, 1983, almost five years to the date after she'd lost her four children, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Though it doesn't make the wound any less painful, make it any less important, I personally am happy this family, who very clearly cared so much for their children, were able to conceive again and continue on as a family. I think a tragedy such as this would have torn a lot of couples apart, but the fact that they were able to support one another, really make an effort having a family again, and succeed, gives this unsolved case at least one bright spot in a sea of darkness, in a case that has been called one of the most gruesome, heinous, unsolved murders in Singapore's entire history. No matter what you choose to believe or what you speculate, I ask you only for respect in the comments below, as always. And remember, though these may be dark matters, the darkness always matters. 
Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to leave a like and a comment and subscribe so you don't miss any more videos from me. If you're looking for other similarly unsolved cases, you can click any of the videos on screen now. Stay safe, friends. I'll see you in the next video, and have a good night.